I'm standing here now with Assistant Chief James Searles, who's been with the Orange Department for 22 years. And behind us, there are pictures of Orange's two previous police department buildings. The first one over there, dating from 1939. 1939. That's correct. That's when the department was officially organized. Yes. And at that point, there were perhaps there were two people that were associated on a full-time basis with the department, and then they used constables in addition to those who were full-time people. Mm -hmm. The building uh, that was first occupied was a small frame building at the corner of Lindy Street and the Boston Post Road, and that was utilized for several years until in 1950, the department, which then had six people as full-time members, moved to uh, 355 Boston Post Road, which is next door to the present firehouse on the Post Road. Mm -hmm. Then uh, that building lasted for a number of years and accommodated 25 plus personnel uh, to the point where it was bulging at the seams and fortunately we were presented with this building that we are in now and it has also become a bit full even at this point. <laughs> so soon. <laughs> so We're soon. off to building number four before. <laughs> no, I doubt that I because so. we can expand this building when the, the time arrives. In this first picture you'll see in the foreground, the first Orange Police headquarters. Actually, it had two rooms. There were a couple of benches in the front entryway. There was one cell inside that was used for every purpose when it was necessary to incarcerate a person. On the left of that police building, you can see a bit of the old Paragon garage and that building stands, or stood I should say, where the Loman Plaza area is presently today. The picture you now see is located at 355 Boston Post Road, which is near Lambert Road. Presently this building is being used by the Orange Youth Services it was built in 1950 by then selectman Elmer Manley. It was basically a Cape Cod style home which was converted and altered to fit the then needs of a police department. At that time this building was a, an ideal building for a small police department. At that time there were six people, including the chief, who used the building. And they operated during the day and evening hours. And ironically, the front door was locked at two o'clock in the morning when they stopped their patrol work until the next day. The left side of the building was on the ground floor full of cell blocks. There were four cell blocks there, a meeting room in the back, and the chief had an office in the front, and the reception area was in the front. Originally, the second floor was all open on the west end. It was used as a meeting room, whereas the east end contained a small bedroom where there were two single beds put up there for officers who were detained late at night or due to storms or whatever the circumstances and couldn't get home. The area there in that picture is quite vacant with just one home, the old Curtis home, showing in the background. This building was occupied and used by the department until 1974, when in May, as a matter of fact, on Mother's Day of 1974, the department moved into the new building on Lambert Road. When you came into this building, perhaps you noticed that there was an absolute absence of
windows, glass, and so forth. And that was because when this building was being designed, we were just completing the throes of the riots in New Haven, and security was foremost in the minds of everyone in law enforcement. And this, of course, was conveyed to the architect. Therefore, when you came through the front door, it's perhaps interested or interesting or uh, a bit dismaying to other people to find that they could be locked out of this building as well as locked in. However, you came in through what we would refer to as the front lobby. And this is where everybody initially arrives if they have a complaint. And then they'll come into the area where you are presently, which is generally administrative, although we have, in addition, our record room, which is right behind the camera. So this is about as far as people come inside the building unless they're being brought in here for a particular reason to entertain a complaint or if they should be perhaps the accused in some case which is under investigation. So in this front part of the building behind the brick wall which you saw on the outside are the offices that the chief and the assistant chief have and the conference room which is used by all for various small meetings and the police commission hold their monthly meetings in that same room. Again, on the front of the building, at the far end, we have a classroom. At the door where the camera is pointed now, and this classroom is also used as a lounge. Beyond the classroom, we also have a full competition pistol range. This building was designed basically in the shape of a wheel and we have to assume that the communications area is the hub of the wheel because all of the activity that takes place occurs there in one form or another whether it be on the telephone or radio and then it's disseminated around through the spokes to the outer edge of the wheel if you can envision it that way whether it be to the administrative group in the front of the building or investigations in the rear or the patrol sector which utilizes various areas within the back part of the building. So why don't you come inside into the communications area. The computer which is seen in the center top of the console is a video tube similar to a regular television set and has a printer attached to it which prints out copies of information that we are seeking or being information is being sent to us. This is all part of a computer system which is tied to New Haven which in turn ties us to a central computer in New Haven where our records are kept also to the state computer in Hartford where we have access to motor vehicle records and records relative to wanted and missing persons. There's also a radio built in the desk that scans the radio frequencies of the area police departments. So we're always in touch and always able to keep on top of the activity that's taking place around us as well as in the town of Orange. This building is set up, or correction, the room is set up with two desks on either end by the lobby where you came in initially we refer to it as an information desk the other end of this room to the right of the camera where the screened portion is in the opening this is utilized as a booking desk when people are brought in here under arrest they are booked at that desk and then they are processed further in the cell room where they have their photographs taken and their fingerprints are also taken. Also immediately off this area is a room which the patrolmen use for report writing. They will investigate accidents further than they would on the road by bringing people in here to talk and learn more of the circumstances around an incident. 
Also off this room behind the camera, we have an office for the sergeants who are the supervisors both inside the building and out on the road. And as you're scanning to the right with the camera, you can take a peek into the arsenal, which has a considerable array of weapons, which are there for police purposes in the event they are needed. Most of them are utilized by the members of our SWAT team. These people are fully trained in the use of all of these types of weapons and take them out when called for. Otherwise, they remain secure behind this locked door in a controlled environment. Again, inside the Orange Police Building, you're now inside the mugshot fingerprinting area of the cell block, which is attached to the male cell block. People that have been arrested are brought in here. Their fingerprints are taken, and their photographs are taken for identification and submission to the FBI and the Connecticut Identification Bureau. After they have been processed as such, then if they are to be held for a given reason, perhaps they couldn't make their bail if they were being held for a bailable offense, they would be incarcerated in this lockup until such time as their bail was received. This is the interior of one of the male cells in the male cell block. These four cells were the first items placed on the slab as this building was being erected. They're all made at the factory and chipped in as one unit and lowered in onto this slab by a crane. There's a closed circuit television system in here which is viewed at the desk. Generally people are not kept here but for short periods of time after the presentation and arraignment in the circuit court. They are then transported to the State Correctional Institute in New Haven. You are now inside the police pistol range. This is a range that was built by the Caswell Company to our specifications. It's a 50-foot competition range. It's used for the training of police officers and also for competition among various police shooting teams. It's a four-bay range. In the back end of it that you see now is a slanted steel backing and the object is to project the spent bullet upward into a spin trap where it loses its velocity and then simply disintegrates and the particles drift down through the backstop into collection pans and the lead that is then placed in those pans is reused, melted down and recast to make more bullets that are used for this training purpose. This range is established so that it is healthful to be in, contrary to some of the ranges that previously were in existence. In other words, we have a completely separate air system in this pistol range. In the gallery portion where people or spectators may sit and the range master operates his console, fresh air is introduced into the range. It flows through the gallery and into the area where the shooters stand. And the airstream is projected downrange so that it carries out all of the smoke and lead residue directly to an outside ventilator so it doesn't contaminate the building. These targets are moved back and forth by electric carriers and at the range commander's option may be operated by his console or they may be operated by the individual shooter. 
They're pre-selected in the distance that they may travel, depending upon the course. The police officers are trained in a shoot-don't-shoot shoot course, which utilizes equipment to selectively and randomly turn a series of target pictures rather than the standard bullseye target. The picture may confront the officer, for instance, showing a woman holding a baby in her arms, whereas the next picture that turns into view may show a woman taking a pistol out of her pocketbook. Or another person may be shown coming at you with a deadly or dangerous weapon. The officer is required at that point to take whatever action is necessary. He may not take any action because the picture that he's being shown may dictate no action and he is penalized if he so much as touches the weapon in the holster at that point. Of course, the range is also used for quarterly qualifications by all members of the police department. They must pass this quarterly exam, otherwise they will not be allowed to participate until they do become totally proficient in the use of the handgun which they must carry. Other members of the department, including the SWAT team, will utilize the range for target practice with special weapons. All the police officers will, in addition to their handgun, be required to qualify with the shotgun. So the range is very versatile and it can be used for every aspect of training which relates to shooting. We are now in the investigations division area of the police department. It's located in the rear of the building. In this area, members of the investigations unit work on their cases, identify stolen recovered properties, and process for fingerprints and other clues that they may find on various articles that they have in their possession from burglaries or other incidents. Here is Officer William Ahern, who is assigned to investigations, who can describe to you some of this apparatus that's on the back wall on top of this table. Here we have an all-purpose fuming cabinet. It's an iodine cabinet where we use iodine crystals. They're heated and they and the fumes develop latent fingerprints on papers, letters that we might be investigating, checks. They develop the latent fingerprints on the items. This is mostly used for paper items. Over here we have a question document viewer we also use for checks to examine the uh, signatures on certain checks which are forgeries or stolen checks. We can examine the signatures and compare them with other signatures we have. This here is a uh, fingerprint comparator. When we uh, find fingerprints, we put them in here and we can compare them with uh, other prints that we have on file by the use of this machine. Thank you very much Thank for a very well. interesting and informative tour to you, Sir Ralph and Chief Hans. It was very nice to, to get to know you and uh, I, I hope you and the town of Orange have a, uh, a very full and fortunate relationship. Thank you very much. Thank you.